Okay, so last video, we talked about push and pull factors that brought immigrants to the United States. And one, one big attraction that brought especially uh, farmers and people that are coming from bad economies was this Homestead Act. Now, the Homestead Act of 1862, which is a strange time, it's happening right in the middle of the Civil War, basically the federal government said, look, we have a lot of land. We're trying to fulfill our destiny of manifest destiny, which is God wants us to connect America from the East Coast to the West Coast. And now we're out in California. This can happen. But we need people to settle this kind of open territory. So we'll tell you what. If somebody comes and is willing to uh, maintain 160 acres of land that we give them to use for five years, then they will get it. They get to keep it, and it's their land. They have to maintain it and take care of it and make sure the lands actually improve. So for farming or uh, they do some alterations. Now, so this applies to Minnesota, Iowa, Kansas, and Nebraska. Now, really, one really important point about this is, is while this is really attractive to European settlers, especially based on climate, so you think like Kansas and uh, Kansas, Iowa might be more like German latitude lines like it's like missouri is very much like france and germany in terms of like what you see temperature wise we have all four seasons and you can grow a lot of different types of food and then minnesota and iowa tend to be much colder nebraska colder areas and you guys know that minnesota has a football team called the vikings well it's not a coincidence there's a lot of scandinavian settlers that came from norway sweden uh and denmark to, to claim this free land in Minnesota of 160 acres. And they knew how to farm and live in that kind of cold climate. That's what they were used to. Well, one group that's really uh, held, is kind of kept back by this, and actually not the only one, was especially people of color, but African Americans. So African Americans did not get the, to make these claims for the 160 acres of land. So this causes some wealth discrepancies once again. Now, even white immigrants, or what we call white now, European immigrants that come over, they get this land for essentially free, and they get free wealth given to them by the United States government, where African Americans do not get to partake in this. There's, there's very discriminatory, and also uh, his, uh, Latin, Latinx Americans as well, uh, and people of Spanish descent a lot of times didn't get into this land. That's why you, re you really do, if you drive from St. Louis and you start going west, you will see a lot of people of European ancestry and not as much diversity. It's not coincidence. The Homestead Act really drove people of European ancestry to these areas. So we talked about push-pull factors. So that's a pull factor. It's pulling people in the United States. They get free land. That's a heck of a deal. It sounds like a dream. Could you imagine being in this tiny little continent of Europe, which is less than half the size of America? And there's no way you get free land in Europe. And you come to America and you get this big plot of land. And then you could start accumulating your own wealth, being your own person. And then maybe buying more and more land and getting bigger. Now, so the first groups that come to the United States from Europe are called the old immigrants. So, of course, the British are the first with settl settlements in Virginia like uh, Roanoke, uh, Williamsburg, which I've been to. you got to go to Williamsburg, Virginia. It's the first settlement permanent settlement in the in the colonies by the British. Uh, but then later the Germans and the finally the Irish come and the Irish are seen as not equals. Those are the non-whites at the time. So we talk about how white is a social construct and white is really maybe symbolic as a, a, a power. So the groups that are not white are in power is the Irish at this time, are, and they would have signs that say Irish need not apply. Very discriminatory, very much like you would, similar to what you would see in America after the Civil War during Jim Crow and the Black Codes, uh, where you saw these discriminatory laws. But there was open discrimination against the Irish. First of all, they're Catholic, which uh, German Northern Germans and the British are Protestant, so they did not do very well with Catholics. And the second part is... Uh, they were colonized by the British and seen as subhuman, seen as not a different race or not as good as the Anglo-Saxons, which were the true white people uh, we've talked about with the, the British and the Germans. 
So up until 1880, and a lot of Irish come, and you can see the map on the left, uh, something like maybe 4.4 4 million Irish people. There's more Irish that left Ireland than there, I think there's are Irish in Ireland today. That's how much immigration are in uh, emigration people that left Ireland to come to the United States not just the United States there's a lot of Irish all around the uh, world because the economy is just absolutely devastated in the 1850s and 60s it really takes off with the potato famine uh, and there's a lot a lot of poverty and then you can see where a lot of the immigration is people are leaving so uh, 3.7 million Austrian Hungary people are leaving in Germany 5 million people leave some Italians, and we're going to get into that. So then you have the second wave of immigrants we call the new immigrants. Not new to us, but the second wave, this giant wave from 1880 and 1930. And these guys are, are again, they're different. They are considered non-white. They're not Anglo-Saxon, and they tend to not be Protestant. They're uh, they're Eastern European, so they're or they're Southern European, so like Italians, which again are Catholic. That is an issue. Uh, Greek, which are Orthodox, Polish or Catholic, tend to be Catholic, even, and Russians tend to be Orthodox. So religiously, they don't fit the mold of Protestant, like Northern Germans and Scandinavians can get away with it because they're, they're Lutheran and Protestant. And then the British, obviously, are Anglican or United Church of uh, England, which is uh, started by King Henry VIII. So this group comes in and also, the, you know, to make things worse... You've got Russians, Greeks, and Italians that have an olive or a darker skin complexion, so they definitely stand out. We have historically, there wasn't a lot of immigration to the south by these groups because there was a lot of discrimination. So uh, for in New Orleans, we have records of like Italians being lynched, very similar situations where it has to do with they are uh, trying to date or they're accused of, of coming on to a white woman, which was the biggest taboo at the time. Uh, or for a any kind of non-white man to to uh, be attracted to or interact with a pure white Anglo-Saxon woman. Um, so a lot most of the immigration we're going to find out for these groups is they don't go to the South. They tend to go to uh, New York and Boston and Baltimore areas where the ports are. But some do go to the South in New Orleans. All right, so here here's a really good graph that kind of gives us some big ideas of how things change. So this kind of reddish color is the Northwestern European ancestors. And up until 1890, there's something like 80% of the immigrants in America are from Northwest Europe, okay? Huge groups are coming in. They're German, Scandinavian, uh, British, English, and even Irish. We talked about even though they're not considered to be a white or of the same group, but they still came. And then by 1900, we see the switch. The switch is to the new immigrants, which are from Southern Eastern Europe. And that's just starting to edge up about maybe something like 55% are coming in. And then very quickly, by 1910, 75% of these groups, and there's huge groups of immigrants coming in at this time. There, There's hard times. There's hard economy issues. There's a lot of push factors. And we, we forget this term of refugees. Remember, a refugee is somebody is displaced because, uh, for example, there's the hurricane that destroyed Nicaragua and El Salvador and Honduras. Uh, so natural disasters, political strife, warfare. You have these totalitarian governments that are, are dictators that are ty ty tyrannical and destructive to these people. So they're trying to come to America because they're attracted to these ideas of you don't, you don't have to necessarily you don't necessarily have to join the military, which is very strange, very strange. Or if you come to America, there's kind of this this dream that you can get a free piece of land because of the Homestead Act. So all these immigrants are coming from the South now, and then you see it starting to move back the other way. And we're going to find out why. Uh, is it the economy getting better? That could be one cause. Or could it also be legality? Could it be the laws? Could it be the, the people that consider them, themselves white? Uh, and the old immigrants are starting to push back, and they don't want these new immigrants coming in. And you see the numbers sway the other way by the 1930s. So something happens. And by the 1940s, the, again, the majority are the from England and Germany and the new immigrants. So we're going to see something happens in the 1920s. Okay. So where did they come from? 
Uh, and where'd they go? Most places, the biggest port is New York City. And we're going to talk about Ellis Island. So Ellis Island is probably processes more people than any other place in the United States. Um, if you're of European ancestry and you're a new a new immigrant ancestry, like uh, we, we talked about like Eastern European, like Polish, Greek, Russian, Italian, and they would just call everybody Slavic if you're Bosnian or Serbian, that ever just Slavic. They would even throw Greeks in as Slavic. They, they, these terms change over time and how we identify each other. And also now we're much more conscious of our ancestry and these social constructs that are created by society. Uh, but you basically, chances are you, your, your family went through Ellis Island. Like I know my family did. I know on my Italian side and my Greek side, they definitely went through Ellis Island. And Ellis Island is still in New York. It's actual. It's actually an island um, in New York, outside New York City. And the reason it's an island, the idea was that, yeah, immigration restrictions were pretty laissez-faire or laid back or hands off up until this time. If you didn't have a criminal record, you're good to go. But the second thing they really, really, really worried about was a pandemic like we've dealt with now. Um, this idea that they would come and bring disease like tuberculosis, uh, hepatitis, and they didn't understand how all these diseases worked correctly. So that's why you would actually have to stay in quarantine for maybe sometimes a couple of weeks or even months, and they'd have to stay in a room and they'd watch you before they let you come into America because they were scared you'd bring disease. Okay, and now we can see the end results uh, up until the end of the 2000s. And this may be changing, and I, I'm curious of what you think, which groups are really increasing. But you have uh, Europeans, so 40 million Americans have European ancestry. It's the biggest group, and that, that is obviously growing every day. Um, Asian Americans are about 12 million uh, people in the United States have Asian ancestry. And we say Asian, we mean all, all parts of Asia except for Oceania. And then, for and this is immigration. And North and South America is the second biggest group with about 22 million people have, have uh, Latinx uh, or um, South American. Remember, Latinx is Spanish-speaking cultural regions where Brazil, French Guinea, and Haiti, they speak French or Portuguese. They're not Latinx. Those are considered like South American or Caribbean cultures like Bar Barbados. That They're all kind of lumped in this North and South America, Canadians as well. And then you look at this, and it just blows your mind. Africa, only 1.5, less than 1.5 million immigrants that come to America legally are, are African. That's how disproportionate it is. So almost all African Americans have slave ancestry in the country as a result of forced, forced immigration. They were brought to the United States through slavery. Very different narrative, different story on how they got here. Oceania, again, hardly anybody, only 300,000 people. And that'd be like the Philippines and uh, New Zealand and Australia, of course. All right. And then you've got who is immigrating? Well, so let's look at other groups came in. So you got the Europeans, but also you have the Asian immigrants. And the biggest group that really comes in at first is the Chinese. And actually, at that point, after that, that's where there's a lot of discriminatory uh, terms and ideas that came towards Asian Americans that everybody was from China, which is not true because you had Vietnamese, you had Laotian, Thai, all these other groups, Japanese were coming into America. But the biggest group originally was the Chinese and they were working on the Transatlantic Railroad, which was actually finished in 1869. It's one of the huge advantages the North had during the Civil War because they had a lot more railroads. And all the trains almost at one point, all trains went through St. Louis, and they went through Union Station. That's why we have this amazing Union Station, which is kind of one of the the wonders of the United States, right downtown St. Louis. Now it's an aquarium, which I'm so glad they did something positive with it. Um, but if you went west for almost 50 years, you went through St. Louis, and you crossed. And the reason was Andrew Carnegie uh, used his steel, and he had a vision. And his engineers built a steel bridge, which unified east and west. And it was in St. Louis, Missouri. And that bridge is still there. We still use it. It was built so well. And it's called the Eads Bridge. And trains would all go across the Eads Bridge. And people would have to come across the Eads Bridge. And this is St. Louis is where you got to go west in the United States. Otherwise, you had to go around the Mississippi through Minnesota. No thank you. Um, or you'd have to use a boat to get across. 
So all trains and, and heavy uh, machinery would have to go through St. Louis. And that's why Union Station was just enormous, a giant railroad station, all kinds of people coming through. So that's really cool. If you have ancestry that lived in the West Coast and they came through the East, guaranteed they went through St. Louis. And actually, if you go to the Missouri Transportation Museum in Baldwin, you'll see the tunnel. And that tunnel, if you ask them about it, uh, is where all the trains went through that went West for something like 30 or 40 years, all the trains went through this one tunnel. They went through it or came through it the other way. There was no way else to get across until later Chicago kind of became the mega center of railroads and surpassed the St. Louis. Now, most Asians came from came to what's called Angel Island in San Francisco. And this would have been very similar to Ellis Island in New York City. So if you have Asian ancestry that came uh, by boat before we get the plane and now most people come by plane or uh, land if they come from Latin America. Yeah, they they would have come through Angel Island, which was almost the exact same setup. It was an island completely separate from the land. They'd quarantine and they do background checks on people. And that's where we've talked about, you've even gotten some uh, very offensive cartoons and terminology that we looked at during the Jim Crow era, where this like Chinaman one, Chinaman two, where they would, they would just lump Asian Asian. Americans into this label that they're all the same and and, and kind of devalue their race or their their ancestry. But the railroad does get completed four years after the Civil War, and this changes everything. And that's when once Carnegie builds that bridge, the Eads Bridge, which was the symbol of the of St. Louis until the arch was built in in the 1960s. Um, everybody's going through St. Louis, and St. Louis is like the third biggest city in America, and it could have been first the way it was going. All right, now we're going to watch a really quick video. It's called No More Questions. I love this video, and it is, um, she is just, it's just a great story, Corey. I want you to check this out, and we are going to skip through this, and you're going to hear this story of uh, Came to America and, and how she grew up. It's a great story. Uh, of course, there's more. Sorry, guys. wasn't very nice. If I make a mistake, my mother, she made me apologize. In our custom, when you apologize to your mother, you have to bring a cup of tea and say, I'm sorry. But I purposely dropped that hot cup of tea in my mother's lap. <laughs> and I wasn't a good student. I always lie to get out of school. Because a lot of boyfriends after me. <laughs> that time I was still young, I was not bad looking then. <laughs> so, what else? Hurry, hurry. I want to go home. How'd you meet Grandpa? I was a training nurse in a hospital. He was there for hemorrhoids operation. So, when your grandpa see me, your grandpa keep on asking me to get married. And I said, I don't like you. You, you have bald head. <laughs> I didn't like him because he's ugly. But one thing about your grandpa, he's very smart. That's it. No more questions. <laughs> Just a couple more questions. Short one. Short ones. Short ones. Tell me about working at Bloomingdale's. What did you do? You know what I do. I'm not going to tell no, you. No, you have to. You have to talk about it. I am a detective. <laughs> I got a very famous designer. I better not mention her name. <laughs> she stole a dress, three thousand some dollar. So I walk out the store. I said, "Would you like to pay me that dress?" <laughs> she said, "Do you know who I am?" I said, "Yeah, you are a thief." <laughs> so, so that's my life. <laughs> Do you have any regrets? 
No, why should I regret? No, I think I'm old enough to do whatever I would like. And that's it. <laughs> You know, there's a line between independent and stubborn, and my mom crossed that a lot. She liked to complain about things, but she didn't really mind. Like, she took care of Grandpa, and she did a lot of that on her own. You knew because she complained about it, but she would do it, even though she complained. Yeah. I don't know how willing she would have been to do StoryCorps if she actually didn't know she had so little time left. It was kind of like one of her last gifts to us. My mother was cremated, and the original plan was to put her in the same cremoral as Next to father. Grandpa. <laughs> but she said, you know, keep me at your place for a while. So uh, right now I have the ashes at home. And uh, I talk to my mom every now and then. I'll tell her good night or I miss you or something like that. So I'm kind of happy she's with me. <laughs> So that is the story core. No more questions. All right, we're we'll gonna go back to our presentation. And we're gonna talk about um, how immigrants are viewed and treated. So some of the consequences of immigration, and I think we still see the remnants of this and have some of these issues today in the United States is this idea of nativism which is this intense opposition to internal minority uh, on the grounds that it's allegedly un-American characteristic. So as these groups come in, this argument is as unfolds that, well, we're the real Americans. We're the natives. We're the ones that were originally here, which is not really accurate because people of European ancestry are were not natives. Uh, the true natives would have been the indigenous Americans, as you can see, in the cartoon and um, what is their place so but the, we see these ideas in all cultures and, and they really shows up that once a group starts like for example Palestine you would have saw some issues where the Jews were coming in but also now you see the maybe the opposite issues so one group feels like their culture is being overwhelmed or too many people of another groups coming in and while the United States have been kind of this really open area of immigration it really changes with the new immigrants which are really culturally, religiously, and they're just not, they're just not white. They're not white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Which leads to the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, which comes back. And it doesn't just come back, it's stronger than ever. While the Klan became a, was uh, ordained a uh, terrorist organization under the Grant administration in the 1920s and 30s, when they come back, they are just blowing at the scenes with people we have some estimates they might hit over 30 million members over the, the 1920s to 30s. Over 30 million people had joined the Ku Klux Klan. And the biggest target was these new immigrants. So hating uh, Italian Americans and Greeks and Eastern Europeans and Orthodox and Catholics. Catholics especially was really popular and acceptable, acceptable under this idea of nativism. And I think we might be seeing part of that those ideas today. Um, Latinx tend to be Catholic, so I wonder if that's a re or if that's still building on this idea that they're not um, the Catholics are different or they're not real Christians or they have a Pope. Uh, and one of the things that really attracted people to the Klan was they used a lot of propaganda to argue that if these Catholics kept coming from Italy and Poland, uh, especially, they were going to outnumber the real natives, which were the uh, white. Protestants, Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and then what would happen is the Pope was top secretly building a bridge from Rome underneath the Atlantic Ocean so he could lead an army to D.C., Washington, D.C., and invade our country, and people believed it. It makes sense to them, and I think you guys know now it took us how many years just to build a little bridge under the English Channel, and that's over, you know, almost 100 years later, but people believe these stories.
Um, they gave him what they wanted to hear, and they fed on hatred and fear. So what laws did the government set? Well, it pushed the government to start making laws, and it really started in 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act. And this is a very interesting law. It excludes the Chinese from immigrating to the United States from 1882 to 1890s for, for 10 years. And you can see in this cartoon, symbolically it's seen as Uncle Sam, which kind of represents the United States government, right? And America is going to kick these Chinese out of here. And you can see he's kicking this man wearing traditional Chinese clothing. Or it looks like a, a Chinese merchant, maybe. And this idea is just so exciting and emotionally positive to them and it's really playing on yeah we gotta somebody's gotta be the problem somebody's the problem and it's the chinese and then later it comes from the chinese to the new immigrants uh and also finally it it, it ends up creating what's called the immigration act in 1924 and this is this is where the door starts closing and this is where we start lifting the bridge and not letting anybody come to the united states anymore uh and the Chinese Exclusion Act sets the ground, but the Immigration Act of 1924 really really basically sets up how we do it today still. It reduced the number of immigrants to 2% of the country population in 1890. So as the country grows, you stuck at, you stayed at that 2%. So even today, we kind of use this as somewhat of a guideline. We only have about a million immigrants coming in a year in the United States. And I actually talked to... Uh, the president of the Federal Reserve in St. Louis uh, when he gave a speech and he said we have about a million immigrants coming in a year and I asked him if that was enough and he said probably not because immigration is really positive for the economy. Uh, there may be such thing as too many immigrants coming in but at the same time in the United States the populations are decreasing so uh, Americans themselves aren't having as many children so immigrants come in they buy houses they start businesses and they actually are statistically less likely to commit crimes than uh, natural-born Americans, which is, is very interesting. And then you hear, we're looking at the uh, the stats and how did the immigration law shape people coming to America? Well, you could see it was at first, almost everybody was Europeans up until the 1920s. And then by the 1960s, 1960s things started to swing the other way, to um, a different group. And that's North and South Americans, Latin Americans start coming in. Uh, a lot of Mexican Americans at the time and Cuban Americans, and then now 1970s and 2010 actually has a misperception. It's not. It's still not Mexican Americans and Cuban Americans as much as it tends to be um, uh, El Salvadorian, Honduran, and uh, uh, Nicaraguan uh, Latinx coming into the country because of refugee status. So you can see these big switches. But once those European Americans came into the country, they start just expanding number-wise very quickly. And that's why you have a majority of Ameri 